From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome inside the ICE house. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Those who listen regularly to our show know I take a minute or two at the top to establish a plausible connection between our ICE house guests and what we do here at Intercontinental Exchange. Sometimes it's easy, as when Tony Blair was in here to talk about a hard Brexit, or David Rubenstein dropped by to talk about taking Carlyle's portfolio companies public. Other times, like when Daytona 500 champion Denny Hamlin was talking about the pickup basketball league he runs in his parquet floor at home gym, well, the linkage gets a little thinner. It's perfectly clear this week. Imagine you're a big hedge fund manager, maybe Dudley Maffee over at Taylor Mason Capital Management, or even bigger, Bobby Axelrod himself in his glass-lined office at AxCap. If you're one of these heavy hitters, you're not only constantly monitoring the markets, you've got your eye on global weather patterns, particularly in the South China and Philippine seas, where so much of global oil moves from port to port aboard supertankers. Hedge fund guys like you and gender non-binary people like Taylor have probably got a hurricane map up on your screen, checking how gathering storms could interrupt deliveries, offshore platforms, vessels, even underwater transmission lines. If the weather looks dicey, you hedge with 20 million or so in futures contracts on Brent crude to throw off your risk. Any potential interruption is another opportunity for arbitrage. And so, for that matter, is the reputational risk if, say, news leaked that a large industrial cleaning firm was forcing kickbacks of salary and benefits from its undocumented workers. If you were paying close attention to the writing, direction, or production design of Billions Season 4, Episode 2, that kind of detail you'd pick up on, and I pay close attention to the show, in my humble opinion, the best episodic drama on television today and certainly in the conversation of the best shows of the last 20 years, up there with The Sopranos, Deadwood, Breaking Bad, The Wire, and Mad Men. Today is a special day. At the Bell Podium of the New York Stock Exchange, several of the leading cast members, along with one of the creators and executive producers, the showrunners of Billions, David Levine, rang our opening bell to celebrate the boffo debut of season four. And straight from the floor, David's come here, inside the Ice House, right after this. Twilio is a cloud communications platform that allows software developers to embed any kind of communications into every software application they build. We see ourselves at day one of a future of communications, which is powered by software. And so we are going to continue to build out globally more ways of communicating. The New York Stock Exchange is a critical part of our global economy. It's amazing for a company to get to be a part of that long tradition. Twilio is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. To watchers of Billions, fans of Rounders, listeners to The Moment, readers of books like City of the Sun or Signature Kill, or followers of our guests on Twitter, Brian Koppelman and David Levine, need no introduction. For everyone else, make do with this. Two best friends, kids who grew up together, have seen the highs and lows of the entertainment industry from every discernible angle and came out on top. While today they're the toast of the town, Emily Nussbaum of The New Yorker wrote last week that Showtime's Billions, now beginning its fourth season, is the rare series that the term guilty pleasure fits nicely. Brian shared on a recent interview that it was just a few years ago that their agent called him and David with the unwelcome news that they were, and I quote, unhirable. How do you respond to that? When you're Koppelman and Levine, you hold yourselves up, write a knock-your-socks-off pilot, and don't give two bits what agents say. It's not how it's done. Or suits trying to give you notes to prove their Ivy League English degrees haven't gone for naught. A response right out of the Bobby Axelrod playbook. Welcome to the Ice House, David. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is, this is great. I'm so conflicted right now, though, because 
You gave such a wonderful introduction and you were nice enough to mention all of the shows that we love. Seriously, our favorite shows, the shows that we aspire to try to get in the company of. But you removed your suit jacket to be comfortable and I see gigantic Boston Red Sox cufflinks, almost like a slap in the face to a, to a lifelong Yankee fan. So Opening I really I don't know tomorrow, what to do, man, this I'm is amazing. Sorry. <laughs> so we're sitting across the table, maybe as adversaries, but, Maybe uh, like Chuck and Axe, we'll figure out exactly. at Yankee Stadium Maybe we'll or find a, Park how a, to, a how place to, to bond feud. somehow. But thank you for having me. I've got billions of questions, David. Let's start with this. How is it to be in front of the camera for once on the floor ringing the opening bell of the New York Stock Exchange today? Well, it, it was a great honor. I got to say, it's a little uncomfortable. You know, I chose to, to make my life behind the camera. So it's a little odd. I was happy to have my strong-shouldered castmates with me, Dave Costable, Kelly Acoin, and Toby Leonard Moore. You know, those are the guys that everybody on the floor wanted to see. You know, they're the stand-ins, the, the traders, and, and the COOs, the hedge fund guys that really do this job. But it was a, a real honor to be there and a, a thrill of a lifetime to ring the bell. The trading community on the floor, you and I talked about it while we were looking out, it used to be 5,000 people. It's dramatically less than that. But you saw the reaction of them to Kelly and David. Do you get this sense as you film on location or visit places with them, how much the show means to a certain segment of the New York financial community? Well, it's great. Whenever we shoot uh, on location in New York, you can feel that it's really a show that's embraced by New Yorkers. They, they love it. They shout out, which is not a New York thing to do, you know. They they call out the characters by name. They want to have a moment. And then they give us the ultimate New York respect, which is they quietly move on and let us shoot the scene. You know, they don't stand there and rubberneck, which is which is like all you could ask for from somebody near your set. But to see these guys here on the floor, it's amazing. They were like the Beatles out there today. I mean, they're getting mobbed. They couldn't they couldn't actually get off the floor because of how many people wanted selfies with them. I mean, you make a lot of statements in your script about how the business works. Sometimes it's not all that flattering. Do you ever get any blowback from actual practitioners about the way you're portraying their industry? You know, in the beginning, when we started putting feelers out to, to sit with hedge fund managers and various people in the business, prosecutors too, there was a, a lot of reluctance and people were saying, you know, we heard it coming back to us. People were saying, that's not me. That's not based on me. I never talked to those guys. And then after the show came out and was a hit, suddenly it became, you know, that was based on me. Or, you know, you should sit with me. I've got stories to tell you. So it's been a great reception. We, we protect the people who tell us stories. We always protect our sources. So we'd never look to hurt anybody. But to see the way it's received, nobody seems to have a problem with with the uh, misdeeds that the characters do. I think people understand that some of it is in the name of drama. And certainly if uh, a lot of it's true, then the people who like the show are certainly saying that they don't do that stuff. You've now had a couple hours to walk around our 110 year old building, been on the floor for a while, spent some time on the sixth and seventh floors that are the, the historic floors of the building. Any location ideas beginning to percolate for season five? Well, you know, I don't want to give any spoilers, but you clearly were, were feeding us some, some behind the scenes locations. And, you know, I don't want to say that you made a binding offer when, when you were talking about a certain private restaurant here, but, you know, if we contact you and our producers get in touch, then we might have to hold you to it. I will always pick up the phone when April Taylor calls me. Yeah, well, you have to or else she'll show up. <laughs> she shows up anyway. Yeah. So let's get to season four in a minute. But let me begin with a warning I don't usually offer to Ice House listeners. Spoiler alert. If you haven't already seen episodes one and two, press pause on the podcast app, head over to Showtime anytime and get yourself caught up. And that being done, David, share with our listeners where season three left off and where we find our heroes and anti-heroes. Axe has been bested by Taylor with the help of John Malkovich's Grigger, and Chuck has been forced to hang up his own shingle thanks to the vindictiveness of Attorney General Bob Barr. I mean, Clancy Brown as Whoa. Jeff Jeffcoat. <laughs> nice. Well, people who've watched the show would know that Axe and Chuck were the worst of enemies for the first two and a half two and three quarter seasons. But then by the vagaries of the battles that they face, 
they they come to a place at the end of the third season where they recognize that the way forward is is by joining forces, by ceasing their blood feud, and by pooling their enormous resources. And it's almost, in a way, you could see that the world barely stands a chance when these two guys, with their smarts and their their toolkits, come together. So, season four starts with these guys in this unlikely alliance. They're both laying in their bulwarks for battle against their enemies. Season four is very clearly about revenge from the start. They each have their sets of enemies. Axe has a target on Taylor for the betrayal that he perceives that Taylor perpetrated against them. And Chuck, with his, with his former colleagues, Jock Jeffcoat, the Attorney General of the United States, and Brian Connerty, one of those spoilers, gets sworn in as the new U.S. Attorney for the Southern District. He's after them. These guys are going to stop at nothing to get their enemies, and they're going to help each other in the process. But it seems as season four begins that Chuck is a little hesitant to actually do the work that's needed to go after his enemies. His dad needs to come in his office and tell him to get off his ass and go get a gun permit for a client. Well, Chuck is in a very unfamiliar position to him. He, by being fired as the U.S. attorney, has lost his power base. And he's opened a, a law office as a private sector attorney. And we do, we meet him sort of at loose ends and not really knowing how to regather. And, you know, yes, his father gives him one of those strange and perverse backhanded pep talks that are so motivating to Chuck. And he starts to gather the strands of, of influence that are available in the city in, in a way that only he knows how so that he can rebuild his position. Your casting, David, is just superb, not only from the original lead cast members that you put in place at season one, but those that have joined in subsequent seasons. Let's hear a little from the attorney general sometime in season three. We use teasers. Those are stallions you put into the stall with the sole purpose of making sure the mare's in heat, prime for breeding. Now, teaser, he didn't get to do any f-ing. He's just there to get the mare ready, take her kicks, try to mount, take some more kicks. And by God, that teaser, he's got a rager going on the whole dang time. But that doesn't matter. As soon as that dam is ready, we yank that teaser out of there, lead the real stud in, and he gets to do all the f***ing. Teaser has to make do with some mangy hay and a bucket of oats. Chuck Rhodes as the ultimate teaser. I mean, casting, writing, David Levine becoming an expert in animal husbandry. How do you do it? <laughs> that, that little bit there is something actually that we've carried around for probably 25 years. At some point right after I graduated college, I went down to Argentina and spent some time down there working with horses. And one of the guys that bred the horses there told me about the way they do it and the way that they, I guess it's like the, the old way. Now it's all, it's all done with modern medicine, but in the old ways, they would try to protect the valuable horses by doing that. And it was so fascinating. I told Brian about it. We thought that it was a hilarious metaphor and really apt if we could find the right place for it. And finally, when we had this swaggering Texas attorney general, we knew that Clancy Brown would be the perfect guy to deliver that stuff. I heard on a podcast when Brian was talking to Damian Lewis, and he was talking about when Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks cast him as uh, Dick Winters in Band of Brothers, you know, that Damian was up against a person who looked exactly like his imagination of Dick Winters. Clancy Brown seems to me like the one person who could play Jock Jeffco. Did you look at a lot of different actors for that role? No, we looked at no actors for that role. We had, we had met Clancy over like about 20 years ago. We were in Toronto making a movie. He was making another movie. We were already huge fans of his then. We ran into him at the hotel bar and we said, hey man, we want to work with you. We got along great. We made him an offer on the movie we were on because of schedule, he couldn't do it. It was too big a part. And we said, you know, one day we're going to get you. One day we're going to get you. And, uh, you know, we never found the, the right opportunity until this one. As soon as we wrote the character, we realized, you know, if Clancy's available and he'll come do this, he's the perfect guy yeah. for it. Your show, episode one, Chucky Rhodes' Greatest Game. The athlete we talked about seems a little out of shape. 
I wrote on Twitter that the shots from Colin Buxy's direction of Paul Giamatti accentuated maybe some advancing girth through somewhat of a wider aperture. One of the recappers observed that both Chuck and Axe are fighting a younger generation more than each other. You and I are 50-somethings. Is this a statement about our place in the financial ecosystem? Well, I mean, that's a great read. Obviously, Brian Connerty and, and Taylor Mason are a younger generation. And there have been some comments to that effect. But everybody loves the romance of the aging pugilist trying to hang on. You know, it would be a rough world to be out in these digital financial waters for real right now. So I'm, I'm glad I don't have to do that. And, you know, these guys didn't get to where they are by, by being quitters. And there's no quit in them yet. So they're going to fight with everything they have, all the wiles they have at, at their fingertips. New York has always been a character in your show, but I was struck episode one, how many of the classic eateries you gave cameos to in a single episode, Barney Greengrass, The Four Seasons, Sparks. I lost count. Are you burning through these locations too fast? I mean, how many seasons worth of A-list joints do you have in reserve? I want to hear just a clip from Anthony Bourdain's A Cook's Tour. Whenever I want to treat myself to the, to the best breakfast in New York, in fact, the best breakfast in the universe, I'm going to uh, a place in my neighborhood, well, famed for just that, the legendary Barney Greengrass, the Sturgeon King. This place has been a New York institution since 1908, when over a million Jews from Eastern Europe made New York City their home. Like everything else in the city, the food and culture that once belonged to them now belongs to everyone. The late, great Anthony Bourdain doing some location scouting for you. Yeah, wow. That, it's, it's moving hearing his voice like that. You know, what a loss, what a great oh. presence he was. But uh, to get back to your question, as far as running out of these power places, the great thing about New York and an ongoing series is as each year goes by, there's gonna be new ones opening. There's still so many in this town, the historic ones, the trendy ones, the ones that are yet to be discovered that, that we don't feel like any concern that we're gonna run out soon. And this particular thing in episode one that Chuck, this run that Chuck goes on, is something that we'd been talking about for a couple of years. Brian loved the idea of trying to hit all the places in, in one episode, you know, the idea that there were multiple power breakfast places. And one, in fact, that, that, that by right should have been in there is the Regency, which is like really the power breakfast room, but we'd used it the previous season, I think in episode uh, 311 or 312. And so we didn't want to repeat and go there. But EAT and Barney Greengrass and Michaels are, you know, right there as far as where the big power players go and sort of chop up the city. So we recognize that Chuck had to make stops at all those places, then the lunch joints, and then just get into the old power dinner joints as his story resolves. Either you or Brian or someone else commented that episodes one and two were sort of a warm up. They're a little light. I'm having a lot of fun watching them. Episode three, we start getting serious. Yeah, I think Brian Brian said we're just getting ramped up or something like that. And and it's true, you know, you, there's a, you've got to reset the table in these beginning episodes. And there's no, there's no reason for it to be a slog because of where we're at. I mean, it needs to move fast. We have a lot of ground to cover. But you know, as the new plots start to get established, it starts to deepen and you start to see these stakes and these characters dig in and really start going after each other. And it, it starts to get heavier and more intense as we go. Toby Leonard Moore, a guy I just met for the first time an hour ago, not the guy as I see him on screen who had pegged for wrecking that sandwich as you tweeted, but he's learned from Chuck in more ways than one. Being the USA for the Southern District takes a lot out of you. It's pretty frustrating. Well, it's a tough job and, and you know, there, there have been some times when Chuck was in the job and Connerty criticized certain decisions he made. And there were a couple of references that Chuck made about how uh, there are a lot of equities to balance when you're in that job and how it's not so easy. And Connerty's starting to find that out now. It's a dangerous world out there, but I wonder as I watch the first couple episodes, does Bobby really need the full Secret Service style detail following him even in his office and on his home balcony? Well, Bobby Axelrod is, he's not risk averse at all, but he's, he's a prudent man. And when he stood across the table from 
a Russian oligarch who is willing to offer to, to murder somebody for him, he realizes that being at odds with that guy puts him in line for that kind of thing. And he's not somebody who's gonna lose what he has because he's being careless or too cheap to hire bodyguards. You end episode one at Sparks. And I'm worried that as I watch it, that NYPD commissioner Richie Sansone's head is gonna be crushed by a passing sanitation truck outside Sparks on 46th Street. But in fact, your crane shot is ripped from the tabloids of the past. Let's listen to Eyewitness News from December 16th, 1985. He was known as a godfather. He murdered on the, he was murdered on the streets of Midtown Manhattan tonight. His name, Paul Castellano, the alleged mafia strongman, killed by three men wearing trench coats and firing automatic weapons at close range. Castellano's bodyguard driver was also killed in the attack. Witnesses say the killer simply walked away and got into a car and then disappeared. Castellano was being tried on federal racketeering charges. David, tell us about your process that melds old fact with new fiction. Well, our process was being in New York as, as kids, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, at the end of high school then, when that, when that happened, being New Yorkers, aware of this history of New York, you know, that was uh, an event in modern history that was incredible, that seemed to tie to so many episodes from from this sort of nefarious past that the city's had. And just when you think that things have gotten too civilized and, and you know, those days are gone forever, you have another Gambino boss getting gunned down Same week. in the city in, in his own driveway. Now, it turns out that it wasn't an orchestrated mob hit, but the result is the same. You know, some things never change. It was an image that we carried around for a while and it was hard to understand how we would, how we would deploy it but those pieces finally fell in together and it made for a really memorable end shot. And, I, and I'm glad, you know, we did look at those, those tabloid shots quite a bit in conjuring up the end of that episode. So I mentioned the screen on Bobby's desk in my introduction at Axe Cap. I know enough about show running to know that David Levine probably obsesses over every frame in the editing room. Staying on process, take me through the process that ends up with that hurricane map over Damian Lewis's shoulder in episode two, arousal template. That's a real world of a hedge fund manager right there. It's what we do at Intercontinental Exchange. Yeah, we, we try to get these details right. We definitely try to immerse ourselves in the details so that if we decide not to hew to the details, we're doing it advisedly. And, and sometimes we move away from fact because we're making a drama, it's fictional, and we have to default to what's most dramatic most of the time. But in situations like that, we wanna create the verisimilitude of the hedge fund. You know, we always make sure that what's up on the screens is the right thing. You know, if Axe is talking about the fact that they're down for the day, he's not gonna have his screens up with all the, with all the P&Ls green, you know? That's just something we wanna pay attention to so that the educated viewers don't, call BS. From the screens to the sandwiches. Another thing about episode two, Chuck throws away a perfectly good half of a deli sandwich right out of the wax paper. What power play is he trying to make to Michael Panay, who's played by Harry Dillon, or is this some wacky Habsies diet that Wendy's put him on? <laughs> well, yeah, I think he's a guy who's showing that he's not going to offer the guy half. And he's in fact, you know, so strong of will that he's not, he's not only not gonna offer it, he's gonna throw it right in the garbage and let the guy wrestle with what he's being told. And then, you know, he's gonna make the most of the half he has. These guys, they can't let go of their Achilles heels. Grigor tells Bobby to leave Taylor alone, he can't. And there goes David Costable telling him he's, he's an American oligarch. And Chuck, when Wendy signals it's time for some fun, he can't be without a secret little box like a child's blankie. A little bit of Taylor's Tai Chi would do them both a lot of good or maybe some TM. Well, they do the TM. They both do TM. And, you know, we've seen them do it successfully and mostly unsuccessfully over the course of the series. But these are guys, these are driven guys. You don't rise to a position of that kind of power as Chuck has. And, you know, you don't accrue billions upon billions of dollars without some kind of nuclear core driving you. And much of the time these guys can control it, but there are other times when it controls them and they have these pathologies that make them who they are. And it's part of their, their self story. It tell, they tell themselves that's 
what got them where they are. So, so they had this incredible belief and it's harder for them to see where it leaves an opening for an opponent. Does Taylor's embrace of Tai Chi stem from your own embrace of mixed martial arts? Well, n I've never done Tai Chi, that's not my thing. I do love studying various martial arts, but, but uh, no, that, I think that goes back to what you're saying about the younger generation. Is the younger generation one that can be that sharp mathematically, that good, that balanced when it comes to risk, but also find a way to have a spiritual side? and be a fully balanced person. That's what I think the younger generations aspire to. But, you know, the astute viewer will see that that gets interrupted by the old oligarch coming and knocking. The younger generation doesn't like, as I would, the black and white cookie from the deli. And as writers, life is like a constant black and white cookie when you're putting words in Chuck's mouth. I had to look up prestidigitation last night. I did not know the definition of that word. As Ira tells his client, as the potential attorney general candidate is up on the podium, New Yorkers want an attorney general who sounds like them, not William Sapphire. Donald Trump knows that too, doesn't he? Well, I guess he does. You know, I don't, I don't know if he speaks the way he does because he feels like uh, it's some answer or if that's the only way he can speak, but obviously it's been effective for him. You guys had to like say, we're gonna put prestidigitation in the script. Well, yeah, you know, Chuck Rhodes is a guy with a big vocabulary and he's happy to use it with flourish. Bobby Axelrod is a guy who has a big vocabulary. He knows all the words. He may choose not to use them, but you're not gonna lose him. Same with Taylor. They may not even speak that much, but you know they can if they want to. We, you know, that particular word was just a fun one for us. We've been longtime fans of magic. And, you know, if you watch if you watch one of Ricky Jay's stage shows, you know, the, the great Ricky, Ricky Jay, Jay who, oh who just passed in another huge loss mm. to the world. You know, you can practically hear him saying it with that smile in his voice I as thought, he's doing it. I thought I was, I thought Ricky Jay's websites would come up when I put that word in, or when I started reading the definition. He's certainly somebody who's used it on stage. We could stay on Bobby and Chuck all morning, but that would miss so much of the delight of the show in the supporting characters. Last year, you brought us Ari Spiros, played by Stephen Kunkin, who's back for more abuse in season four, sort of like a Barney Fife to Andy Griffith. <laughs> Barney Fife. Well, you know, he's, he's, Spiros has been in the show since the beginning. He was in the pilot, and he's the one who comes in with the, the case on Axe that Chuck ends up taking up. Right. He was at the SEC as head of enforcement. And then he sort of bounced around in various positions until he got brought on board Axe Capital. And, you know, that was just something for us when he was playing those guest roles, we loved what he did so much that we were just trying to figure out how to make him more a part of the main. And if you watch these worlds, you see it all the time. And a character that carries a lot of influential weight because of his office, but he's in many ways a weak character. But from weak to strong, this year you bestow upon us Bonnie Barella, played by Sarah Stiles, straight out of Staten Island, it seems. She reminds me of Melanie Griffith as Tex McGill in Mike Nichols' Working Girl. Let's hear her listen. Ms. McGill. Yes. That's your desk in there. I don't think so. Oh, yes. I sit out here. Sorry, I thought the secretary would sit out here. That's right. I'm the secretary. If it's okay, I prefer assistant. You've had a 10 o'clock meeting with Slater from development here, 11 o'clock with Donahue from logistics, his office on 23, and lunch with Mr. Trask, his office downtown, 1 o'clock. You've got to have a hoot, David, weaving these strong figures with tethers into your past, into your storylines. That's such a great movie moment. Love that. Love that end of Working Girl. Yeah, Sarah Stiles. I don't, need, I don't know where she's from, actually. I, she's probably told me, but I've forgotten. I don't think she's putting on anything there. The minute we saw her read, we knew that she just popped as this character. We knew that it was time for another strong presence at Axe Capital, another strong female presence besides Wendy, you know, somebody who was actually in the main on the trading floor. And from her first episode, she's just like torn this, this character apart. We love it. And, you know, 
we'll write for as much as we can. When we come back, more with David Levine, Billions showrunner, his friendship and partnership with Brian Koppelman, and where Billions goes from here. That's right after this. As U.S. oil markets evolve and production continues to increase, exports have risen to meet demand for light, sweet crude. The ICE Permian WTI Futures contract reflects this changing landscape with price discovery, settlement, and delivery in Houston. Transported directly from the Permian on the Bridge Tex and Longhorn pipelines, this well-known quality crude can be shipped across the globe from multiple ports along the Gulf Coast and offers additional hedging and trading opportunities in a transparent electronic marketplace. Intercontinental Exchange, shaping tomorrow's oil markets. We're back now with David Levine, creator, executive producer, and showrunner, along with Brian Koppelman of Showtime's Billions, now starting its fourth season. Before the break, David and I were talking about doing a Bill Simmons-style recapables of season four so far, but now I want to turn back the clock. And either you or Brian told Jim Rome recently that you finished the writing for season four finale, and I get a sense from listening to Brian's podcast and tweets what he does during hiatus, but chart the next months for you from here. Is it back to Paris and Argentina for another walkabout? <laughs> no, now I have uh, I have three kids, so it's I don't get to go very far because they're still in school. I take them to those places, but they have to go to school. So what we have for the next month is, is finishing post-production on the episodes. We have to finish cutting the last couple, then making sure the, the music is right, and then we go in and just do the final color grading. So that's going to take us the next five, six weeks. Then we're going to have a little time off. We have some stuff we're going to work on together. We'll probably work on some stuff separately. I'd like to believe I'm going to chill out and relax. I don't know if I know how anymore. You know, at the end of last season, because of the air date of this season, they asked us to roll into it. And we had we had three days off, basically. We had from a Wednesday until a Sunday, and then we went back in. And that was a little brutal. So it's been like two years nonstop. So I'm gonna have to relearn how to do less. That journey to France and Argentina that you talked to Brian about on his episode, and as you reflected on it, I think you were a little sort of self-critical that it was maybe, you know, in some ways a little immature. You said you were sending Brian pictures of you, you know, writing at cafes. And yet, you know, we were just talking that a pivotal scene in this season is drawn from your understanding of animal husbandry and bringing up horses in Argentina. I mean, if you take a serious think back on that time that you, I think, had left L.A. and were trying to go out and discover yourself as a writer, does it have more value to you than you joked around with Brian about? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's an easy thing to make fun of. And when you're sitting with your best friend, it's it's always fun to, to poke fun at yourself and the way you were, how earnest you were when you're young. But the thing is, if you want to be an artist, have a career in the arts... The line between sort of delusion and being successful is very, very thin. It's, it's invisible really. And you're the only one who knows if, if there is that line there. So there's a certain amount of self-hypnosis in the beginning that has to take place where you have to convince yourself that you, not only can you be this writer, but you are it. And there's no outside evidence in the beginning. So you just have to believe it. So that's really what was going on there. I was, I put myself in a position where I had to write material or else I was gonna be nothing and have come up with nothing during this time. And I had to learn how to, you know, do my craft. So on a serious level, that's what that was. It was, it was trying to live the life, the outer trappings as I'd come to perceive them because I didn't know any writers really. I didn't know any artists personally to ask about it. So it was what I'd read in books and seen in movies and stuff like that. And you're doing some kind of an impersonation until it becomes real. And that's what was really going on. Last year, you came out with another novel, your sixth, I think, and your fourth Frank Bear novel. I loved writing my book, but the buzz around it lasts for like two weeks and then it's done. On a 13 week season, it's like you've got a new book out every Sunday night at nine. What drives you to keep writing books when the rewards and acclaim seem so much greater for TV? Well, that's a great question. You have an understanding of this. Yeah, 12 episode seasons. And, and we have what's quickly becoming sort of the, the throwback style of release, which is 
Instead of them all becoming available at once, like on a streaming service, we still air week by week. Now, obviously some people save them up and binge them, but in effect, the season for the weekly viewers, the people doing that old fashioned style viewing, it becomes a a little bit of a conversation that lasts for three months. And that's incredibly rewarding. You know, we were a little bit nervous at first. We were like, in a world where you can watch them all in a row, what's gonna happen? Are people gonna be interested? But the way it's worked out, we're so glad because it does keep it alive and it makes it a real thing. And you're you're still making the last episodes as it's airing. And it's a real thrill. It, It makes it all so real. You know, writing the books, whether they're received with a lot of enthusiasm or just sort of like a quiet pebble falling in the well, they're incredibly rewarding. They're a reward unto themselves, just finishing them. You know, I love writing those books. I love that character. There probably will be another, but for the first couple of years of this show, I gave myself the gift. And I think I gave myself the readers of those Frank Bear books, the gift of not trying to do both. I said to myself, don't put that on, on the to-do list because it's gonna probably overstress both things. So I threw all my energies into the show. And I'm really glad I did. You know, with an extended break, I'll probably dip back into writing some fiction. Brian and you pound the best friend story hard, but you should because it's so meaningful to both men and women. I've got a best friend from growing up outside of Boston, Adam Rossman. We had periods when we were able to work together, but never on our own thing. You've always been friends, but you weren't always partners. How did you get together as a team? We had been friends since we were like in our mid-teens, great friends went to different schools, lived in different places at various times, seemed like our careers were going in different directions to a degree. Brian was succeeding in the music business. That seemed like it was gonna be his life. I had started working in the movie business. I sort of learned the ropes a little bit, realized that I couldn't really write my own stuff and become a creator while I held those jobs, so I, I broke off the, the career path and started working on writing my own stuff. Right around this time, Brian recognized what was really in him was not being somebody who helped recording artists make their records was he wanted to create his own material and he wanted to be a writer. And it was around the time he had his first kid. He wanted to be someone who could honestly tell his kid that you should go live your dreams and do what it is that you want to do in life. And he came to me when I was bartending And he said that he was dying to try this. He wanted to write a screenplay. And I said, you know, I just finished a book. Why don't we write one together? And then we started to try to figure out what it was gonna be. And one night soon after he got taken to this poker club Hmm. and that became the inspiration for Rounders. So we didn't, it wasn't a direct path towards doing this thing together because we didn't both know that it was our calling. And we certainly didn't know that it was something that we should do together. It seemed like maybe it was a solitary thing until we figured it out that it could be a, a joint thing. And then it worked so well right off the bat that there was no question that we were gonna continue. There was such a power in joining the sort of shared palette of, of references that we had and the sensibility. It immediately became clear that there was like an energy there in the writing of Rounders that we just, we stuck with and wrote it. And yet, Success is never permanent. I mean, at the top of the show, I mentioned that there are periods in your careers when the doors were closing or completely shut. When it got bad, how bad did it get for you? Well, Brian really loves, he'll come in here and he'll talk to you about this because he loves talking about the lowest of the lows because I think uh, as a storyteller, that's the natural turn towards then talking about, you know, the opposite. But it got pretty grim. You know, the, the thing about, movies and shows and really anything you're working on, but especially when you're working with big groups of people, they don't always turn out well. You can't get everybody paddling in the same direction all the time. People have different ideas. People have different abilities to influence processes. And sometimes those disparate elements come together in an amazing additive way. Like with Rounders, John Dahl directed that. He had a different set of ideas that he had coming to that script than we had. We all came together and all of our artistic sensibilities blended into something that was really cool and something that we would have never done separately. 
But sometimes the thing just comes together as like a Frankenstein's monster and it just gets up off the table and it's ugly and monstrous and terrible. And that's where we'd found ourselves. And it was a moment where, you know, we had this movie come out, it was a bomb. And there was a thing that, that was sort of like the director in Hollywood gets the credit and he gets the blame when a movie's a hit or a bomb. And our agent called us and said, this movie's a bomb, it's gonna be really bad for you. And we said, yeah, but the director should take the hit on that because we just wrote it. And he goes, no, you guys are special. In this case, you're gonna get the blame. And we were like, that's unbelievable. But that's where we found ourselves. Fortunately though, we had learned a long time ago and had the ability as, as writers and creators, you can, you can sort of deal yourself your next hand. So we wrote our next ticket and that turned out to be Billions. Will your season be over by May 31st? That's debut date of the Deadwood movie. I think that we go into June, oh, just God. by doing the math. So I just got to tell you, we're going to have a little conflict on mm. May 31st. That's the debut date of the Deadwood movie. Date night for the King household. Let's hear a little preview. This town is a sanctuary. Every man worth the name knows the value of being unreachable. It'd be a pity not to recognize what's at stake. What's the move, Al? You ever think Bullock of not going straight at a thing? David, I know you and Brian hold the works of David Milch up in high regard. He only got three seasons to tell that story, and now you're on your fourth. Aaron Sorkin's idea for West Wing got nine. David Chase got six with The Sopranos. How many seasons will it take for Chuck and Axe to ultimately resolve their conflict? That's a great question. If, if I told you a number, I'd be lying because we don't know the exact answer. We have versions of answers that have to do with, as long as this stuff and these characters and these subject matters are alive to us creatively, we'll keep doing this because this is the most fun we've ever had. This cast and crew that we work with are so amazing. They allow us the freedom to write and go absolutely anywhere with the story and it can all come to fruition in a great way. So we will keep going. You know, They haven't announced season five yet. They go one at a time at Showtime and they usually announce it during the season while you're airing. So in a world where we don't make those decisions and anything can happen, you know, they could decide not to do it. All signs are likely that we're gonna make season five. There's been a lot of discussion about preparing for that. Beyond that, it'd be irresponsible for me to talk about, though we have various versions of a six, seven, eight and beyond sort of table for the way this thing could run, you know, without specifics, just stopping points, various energies, reversals, things like that. So this is a story that for us can run for a long time. Later on in this season that is currently running, I think, I hope, the NYSC makes a cameo, sort of like the Feast of San Gennaro does in episode two. Brian tweeted out your admiration for April Taylor, who was our hand holder as well. It's one thing to put words on a page like you and Brian too, but you also really run a small business. It's another thing to move trucks, cameras, craft services all over the city. Talk about prestidigitation. As we wrap up, give a nod to the team that turns this magical city of ours into a film set six months out of the year. Yeah, well, you mentioned April Taylor and she's a producer on the show. She's the line producer. She's sort of like the, the beginning point of where this stuff is on a page and in our heads and becomes a reality. She's incredibly tireless, marshalling our resources and making it happen. She's got an amazing team working with her, Jake Brown. We have a guy named Mike Harrop. Then we have incredible ADs, the assistant directors who alternate sort of running physical production for the visiting directors. We have amazing heads of department all the way through the PAs on this thing are so dedicated. And, you know, we have incredible guest directors come in and visit. And some of them are more than visitors. Like you mentioned, Colin Buxey, he's done three episodes last season, three this season. He did one the season before, that's where we got to meet him. You know, we have people repeat. Unfortunately or fortunately, some of these people are so talented that they book a lot of other shows and movies and we can't get them all back when we want. But, you know, without these collaborators, we couldn't put this thing on its feet. On that note, David, 
Thank you so much for sharing your story with us here inside the Ice House. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was David Levine, creator, executive producer, and showrunner, along with Brian Koppelman of Billions on Showtime. Watch it every Sunday night at 9 p.m. or stream it on demand anytime you please. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash and Teresa DeLuca, along with the NYC broadcast team led by Ian Wolf with Ken Abel at the controls. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 